The case that I'd like to present is that of a 38-year-old African-American patient of mine. Uh, she was a woman who presented with complaints of decreasing vision in both eyes for about four years. She was complaining of impairment in her night and peripheral vision, as well as some photophobia. Now, unfortunately, she was not the best of historians, and her complaints were somewhat vague, and it was uncertain as to the severity of these problems. However, her bigger trouble was that over the past two years, she actually was experiencing problems with her central vision which progressed rather quickly initially, and then it plateaued. Her past medical history is notable for deep venous thrombosis and clotting problems during her pregnancy, but she has not had any clotting problems outside of that. She also has a history of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and has been struggling with depression as well. She is on a number of medications including Coumadin, Zoloft, Abilify, Crestor, Niacin, and Vitamin A. She's taking some artificial teardrops, but really is on no other ocular medications and really has no prior ocular history either. Family history is positive for glaucoma. She does not have any previous drug allergies. On examination, visual acuity with correction measured 2200 on the right and was 2100 on the left, and at near she was 2200 on the right and 2070 on the left. AMS grid testing did reveal some areas of paracentral distortion on the right side, but was unremarkable on the left. Ishihara color vision plates, however, were markedly reduced, and she was only able to see the test plate in each eye. Tensions measured 13 on the right and 14 on the left side. External examination revealed a fairly normal exam, and there did not appear to be any evidence of ptosis. Sit lab examination was relatively unremarkable, although she did have evidence of trace nucleosclerotic cataracts in both eyes. Fundus examination was quite striking for what appeared to be some degree of relative hypopigmentation relative to the more darker background fundus in the central macula. So it appeared that the central macula on an initial inspection was somewhat abnormal. The retinal arterioles did appear to be somewhat narrowed for a person of this age, although were not dramatically so. She was also noted to have evidence of a ciliary retinal artery on the right side. A single lone, tiny, whitish appearing drusen was noted along the infrotemporal arcade in the macula on the left eye. There was no evidence of any RP hyperplasia or bone spicle pigmentation elsewhere in the fundus. Red free photographs also illustrated the, the lack of significant RP hyperpigmentation in the fundus. The periphery is not illustrated in these posterior pulse slides, but it was really quite similar. Spectral domain OCT testing was performed in both eyes and showed evidence of cystoid macular edema in each eye, although it was interesting that a foveal depression was still present and most of the cysts were somewhat eccentric. However, the most striking finding was that there appeared to be excellent preservation of the inner segments and outer segments, as well as the outer nuclear layer in the central portion of the B-scan. But as one looked at the peripheral edges of the B-scan, it was quite apparent that the inner segments and outer segments were lost, as was the outer nuclear layer. And this finding was quite consistent in both the right and the left eyes. This constellation of findings was pretty much diagnostic. In fact, the OCT alone was fairly diagnostic in this patient, and no additional imaging or diagnostic studies really were necessary. However, we did obtain a fluorescent angiogram, which again showed a relative hypofluorescence centrally, but showed increased fluorescence surrounding this area throughout the posterior pole. There were no areas of abnormal leakage, nor was there any disc hyperfluorescence in either eye. In fact, in the late frames seen on the next slide, there was no leakage really by angiography whatsoever. Now, this patient did go on to get some additional diagnostic testing. In particular, electrophysiology was obtained, and you can see here that the flashy VEP was pretty flat, and really no signal could be recorded. But the real confirmatory diagnosis, and again, the imaging studies were diagnostic here, but if we, one goes on to obtain a photopic cone response, you can see that the amplitudes are really quite reduced, although the cone response is still recordable. Two sets of acquisitions are shown. The 30 hertz flicker was also quite reduced, although it was still measurable. But the rod response really was completely flat and was essentially extinguished. The max response, I did show some response because, as I noted, the patient did have some partial preservation of cones, but again was significantly reduced in amplitude. And lastly, we did obtain Goldman visual fields, which showed significant constriction of the visual fields in both eyes, particularly on the left side. 
And so, in summary, what is the diagnosis? Well, based on this constellation of findings, this is an example, a very nice example, in fact, of a patient with retinitis pigmentosa, CNA pigmento, with evidence of cystoid macular edema. Again, the OCT findings on this patient were essentially diagnostic, showing the preservation of the outer segments and outer nuclear layer in the central macula, because that is the part of the, uh, of the eye that's not been yet affected by the full effects of the degeneration. But there was evidence of loss at the outer extremes of the scans, again, very typical of retinitis pigmentosa. The presence of cystoid macroedema is also very common in this condition. In any event, this patient was not the optimal patient for systemic medication use, and she was not particularly excited about taking Diamox, so we tried her on topical durazolamide drops in both eyes. We also did an audiology as well as an internist consult to make sure that the patient did not have evidence of auditory deficits or Usher's syndrome. Genetic testing and counseling was also obtained, as well as a referral to a low vision service. In any event, a patient, after being started on drosolamide, actually noticed a significant improvement in the cystoid macroedema, as was seen when she returned for follow-up imaging in October. Her visual acuity also improved slightly in both eyes, and we have been continuing drosolamide therapy. Certainly, the use of low-dose diamox has been well established, or diamox or acetazolamide has been well established in this condition, but there have been reports of using topical therapy as well in a patient such as this who was reluctant to use use the systemic therapy, the topical therapy proved to be a very good choice. In January of 2011, patients showed continued improvement with continued reduction in the edema. She was found to have evidence of a hearing deficit and she's being fitted for a hearing aid, although we do not believe that she has Usher syndrome per se. So in summary, this is an illustration of a patient with retinitis pigmentosa, which of course is a rod cone retinal dystrophy with variable genetic deficiencies and transmissions. The disease features a typical hallmark, including nyctalopia and progressively decreased peripheral visual fields, which this patient demonstrated. The classic findings include optic nerve pallor, vessel attenuation, RP modeling and granularity, and of course the very characteristic interretinal pigmentation in bone spicules. This case is a very nice example of a case of RP CNA pigmento where one does not see these bone spicules. There are of course many other associated findings including posterior subcapsular cataracts, glaucoma, and hyperopia. And OCT, as I said, can be very helpful and can be diagnostic in many cases such as this one. In these cases of CNA pigmento, the pigment may not be present for many years, although in my experience in the very late stages, even in, in, in these patients, some RP hyperplasia may begin to develop. The causes of central vision loss in patients with retinitis pigmentosa, of course, include the very end stage manifestation of the disease when the complete visual field is wiped out. But earlier on, one can lose central vision from cystoid macular edema with, with associated diffuse retinal vascular leakage. In some cases, uh, macular retinal fibrosis and RPE changes may also be noted. Usher syndrome, which this patient may not have, and again, we are not convinced that this is the case, although certainly is a concern giving her hearing problems, is much less common. Its prevalence varies from 1.8 to 6.2 in 100,000. There is autosomal recessive deafness associated with retinopathy and in some cases vestibular dysfunction. It represents 18% of all patients with RP. And again, it's quite rare, but on the other hand, it is the most commonly associated RP syndrome. And it does account for approximately half of U.S. patients who are both deaf and blind. And again, the early disease may be missed in the absence of the bone spicule of retinal pigmentation. And in some cases, there are patients who, of course, are misdiagnosed as having rubella retinopathy, which can also manifest with pigmentary changes in the retina and deafness, although there will not be the extensive visual field loss seen in this patient. There are a number of different subtypes of Usher syndrome based on the time of onset and the severity of the auditory and the visual disorders. As far as the genetics of Usher syndrome are concerned, there have been a variety of different potential genes that have been identified, and this represents a subset of the various genes that are noted in retinitis pigmentosa. It's interesting that all of these genes seem to encode proteins which interact to form sensory neuroepithelial cells in the inner ear as well as the retinal photoreceptors, and we don't have the genetic testing results for this particular patient to see if Usher's is, in, in fact, the right diagnosis. Now, the treatment, of course, is earlier cochlear implantation, and it's very important in improving expressive and receptive language.
Again, there are a variety of pigmentary retinopathy plus deafness syndromes to keep in mind, including infantile adult refsum disease, cocaine syndrome, Bardet Beetle, Alstrom, Flynn Aird, Friedrich Ataxia, and of course, Karen Sayer syndrome. And lastly, I'll leave you with some very nice references that one could take a look at for additional information. And thank you very much for uh, listening to this presentation.